<laughs> All right, so today we're talking about privacy ethics and engineering and emerging technology. I'm going to stand here. Usually I stand out in front of the yeah, presentation, yeah, but we got the clicker set up. Maybe someone can help us with the clicker to make sure it's it's working all right. Let me just test it real quick here a couple times. Eh. All right, live B. So I'm from Instructure. I just want to introduce myself and kind of talk to you about how we've approached these particular topics at Instructure. Um, Oh, before we do that, we have some related breakouts that you should be aware of that will also help with you in designing your privacy programs uh, within your various organizations. So, um, from my standpoint, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a security engineer at heart. I love to build. I love to help other organizations build their security programs from the ground up. I've done it a couple of times now. Um, now, the question that you're probably asking is, why is the security guy talking about privacy and ethics? Uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit later in the presentation. But for me personally, I'm extremely motivated by being a part of organizations that have this really meaningful impact to humanity. And right now, um, helping uh, Instructure along with their journey. A little bit about Instructure, and I provide this only as context for the rest of the presentation, uh, not as like a marketing pitch or otherwise, but largely my intent here is to show how we at our organization have approached this and hopefully things you can glean in your own. So a little bit about Instructure. Some of you may have used our products before in your learning and development journeys. Uh, one is called Canvas. That's for K through 12 and higher education schools to basically help um, people and instructors in their teaching and learning journeys. Um, our mission statement is help people grow from the first day of school to the last day of work. Um, we definitely help people aid in, in those conversations, whether it be development conversations within your organization between a manager and an employee, or whether it be between an institution or a teacher and a student at an institution. So I put up this slide because in my journey, and maybe the case with many of you in your journey, as I've seen these kind of viewed as mutually exclusive within organizations. But what I've found is they really are a synergistic type of relationship when you have them both together. Uh, in the past, um, you know, a security team may be like, hey, we have all of these data elements and we need to secure those data elements regardless of what they may be. Whereas a privacy professional may be looking at saying, hey, what type of data elements are we actually capturing? Why do we need those? Are we removing those at the end of contracts? Are we making sure the life cycle of data uh, elements within our infrastructure, are they following what we've committed to do with, with customers? And so you may have those two approaches, but in our case, if I were to draw like a Venn diagram where they're both uh, juxtaposed over each other, they're really um, awesome parts about each of them and how that's helped us in our journey uh, as we've, you know, considered privacy in the security world and considered security in the privacy world. So um, I started the security team in Instructure a few years back and uh, we wanted to, I wanted to distill the approach for security down into three different objectives. So it's super simple, straightforward on how we wanted to approach it. I mean, most of us think, hey, a security team detects bad things or detects things that we're doing incorrectly. And then they also secure against those things or help people within the organization secure against bad things from happening to the organization. I feel like sometimes this third one is left off uh, or not considered because folks are so in-depth looking into the detecting and the securing against those things that the essence of where I come to security and, and feel like it's an important aspect of most security teams or privacy teams are build and maintain the trust of customers. And I feel like privacy fits extremely well into this place so that really between customers and our organizations, we have that sync between each other to make sure that, hey, we've established this trust and we want to maintain this trust, especially with regard to data elements. Um, one of the values, core values at Instructure is openness. Uh, this has really helped fed into the natural approach to saying, hey, I want to make sure that the things that we say we're doing from a privacy standpoint, from a handling of data from cradle to grave, are the same, same things that you are understanding that we're doing with those things. And so as we approached openness, and especially with ethics mm. related to this particular presentation, um, we wanted to make sure that was very much in sync and very much aware that they are easily able to understand what we're doing with things and that we are actually doing what we're saying we're doing. So from a privacy standpoint and data residency standpoint, uh, at least within our organization, these various layers of the stack looking at data, you have the controllers, you have the processes of data. We very much fit 
uh, and holistically deployed on top of AWS, uh, we, we fit in the data processor realm. And so the way we approach privacy in our designs and our architectures and our deployments and development models uh, is very much similar to, analogous to the way AWS has approached mm -hmm. this, um, which has been, hey, we want to enable our customers with the tools to manage the data elements that they control from cradle to grave and make sure that is all congruent with how they're communicating that with customers. Our primary um, customers on our end have been uh, schools or institutions, uh, higher education learning, um, and then you know straight up businesses with the development, career development, learning journey, uh, or bridge. And they largely manage that uh, conversation with customer, or their users or end users. But on our end, we make sure that we are enabling them and emboldening them with the features or tools or sets within our software to allow them to do that effectively. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the journey and structure, the way we approach this internally. Um, really quick, we have, um, so I'm, I'm our chief security officer, uh, our VP of security at Instructure. We made a very strategic relationship between security team and our legal team. Uh, and so that's kind of what this slide is. Definitely value the input from our legal team. Our DPO, our data uh, privacy officer, sits on our legal team. And it's become a very, just again, synergistic relationship between the two. We both bring different talents to the table, and then we both make sure that uh, we're holding each other accountable with regard to being good stewards of the data that we, that we have. Um, as we started arm in arm, this was a few years ago. Um, now, granted, before our time together, uh, this member of our legal team and myself um, kind of, you know, that we had probably similar to most organizations where you have either tribal knowledge or understanding where we're doing things, and we're definitely doing things the right way. But the formalization of the program was definitely an arm in arm effort as we walked alongside each other to first scope out, hey, what data elements do we actually have? This was very well known. We just decided to formalize it into a data inventory or a data map. It made conversations with customers extremely easy uh, to say, these are the data elements that we have, and these are why we have them. And we also note, are these optional elements or are these ones that are required? to use as part of the functionality of the product that we provide. So um, in most cases, we make most of these fields optional. So customers are able to input whatever fields they'd like to on their end. If it's going to be a long random string or a GUID representing their users on their end in our system, we won't know who the identities of those individuals are as they use the service uh, that definitely enable our customers to do that from an emergency technology standpoint. Um, like many of us in the room, you know, we hope to maximize the value of the data elements that we have in as much as it improves the learning journey of our end users while still being good stewards of the data elements that we've been given. So <laughs> this slide may be a little bit more obnoxious in, in reality, but, you know, at Instructure, we try to approach things in a way that simplifies them, but allows us to execute them carefully. So we definitely don't have a stack of these papers sitting all over desks at work, especially relating to having a robust privacy training and privacy policy. We try to distill it down to the most distinct language as possible and to make sure our internal folks know about it as well as our external folks so that they um, are able to you know, effectively enact the things that we've promised our customers to do. Um, one more point on this one, actually. This year is when we decided to actually join our privacy pr uh, internal training program with our security and our compliance training programs so that it made it a seamless experience for our internal employees to take the training and have all of those elements covered in one very distinct and very easy to understand training so that we were able to cover the privacy aspects, the security aspects, as well as our compliance and risk aspects. Largest want to show, I mean, this looks pretty, probably pretty familiar to your, um, or to our various development programs. I just wanted to note on here the various areas that we have inserted privacy and security within our SDLC. Um, you know, they definitely are hand in hand in every step of the way. From a security standpoint, we're using various scanners in our code. From a privacy standpoint, we're checking to make sure that in our backend database, the fields that we've added to the, the database for various elements that we plan on collecting um, actually match what we designed and planned in the beginning. Um, the last one is just making sure our customers are very aware of the, the changes that uh, we've added to um, the application as part of you know, being good stewards of these data elements. <sighs> Lastly, um, I'm actually an AWS native. Uh, I started at AWS, gosh, <laughs> 
a long time ago. It was back when AWS had a much, <laughs> much smaller team in general. It was, you know, back in 2008, 2010. Um, and it's amazing how it's grown over time. And these services have definitely helped us in our journey from a security and privacy standpoint to embolden us to be good stewards of these data elements. So um, as we've approached our build process, we've said, hey, how do we make sure these things are built in for our customers to use from a you know, data controller standpoint? But, um, and maintaining, like I mentioned before, these open agreements and understanding with customers, but there's several out of the box tools that we use and we love that we've uh, definitely embraced and have become a part of our core operating structure. Uh, Guard Duty's been fantastic in helping us detect things with regard to um, weird things that may be occurring in our infrastructure. Uh, we receive those in various, you know, text-based means that our team members, whether it be while walking the dog or whether it be, you know, at our desk working during the day, that something random has just happened and we want to look at that and investigate. So um, Trusted Advisor has been fantastic to make sure we're using this the appropriate way. We definitely have taken advantage of the well-architected and well-secured reviews. Um, it's been extremely helpful working with the AWS folks to make sure, hey, we didn't forget something and we're definitely benchmarked against what folks would expect us to be doing with regard to our use of AWS. Can I, uh, can I ask you yeah, a yeah, question? Go ahead. Well, this is totally unscripted, by the way, so his answer may be very uncomfortable. Are you using any marketplace solutions at all in any of the work that you're doing? Great question. You know, every time we approach a new uh, solution or a new way of handling things, we definitely check out the marketplace, say, is there something out there already that makes sense mm. for us to use? Um, if we've evaluated some of those items, we're like, hmm, the cost structure here doesn't make sense, or maybe the cost structure does make sense, and we're able to move forward those. There are any particular ones that I'd want to call okay. out, but definitely a fantastic, valuable resource for us to look at before we say, let's go build our own that's going to take a few months <laughs> or a few years to actually yeah. do and, and maintain after that. So, yeah, you have to maintain it. Yeah. yeah, great question. The marketplace has been fantastic. Okay. So um, from a security hardening standpoint, FYI, I mean, um, you know, one of the things a lot of these frameworks call for are having hardened images, images or a good baseline to follow. You know, CIS and uh, this, the DIS is STIGs and various other um, standards out there that help make sure that we're deploying things in a hardened, good state. Um, we definitely have looked at the marketplace for those, say, hey, is there an image that exists right now for the image, you know, the underlying OS we'd yep. like to go for, so we don't have to go through and harden our own. So, inter okay. that's, a, that's an example. Okay, that's a good example, thank yeah. you. Oh, great question. Um, lastly, config rules are extremely helpful, or a lot of organizations have adopted just building their own lambdas and checking their AWS, uh, you know, accounts against the, those particular compliance checks. Lastly, you know, Macy and just good use of tags from an inventory and data ownership standpoint. Tags have been extremely helpful to help us know who owns what, why, what they plan on doing with those things, and how we can trace those things down if there's anything concerning with them. Lastly, CloudTrail, we do a significant amount of log-based alerting, uh, at least from a, making sure that we have good accounting for what's happening with all of our assets. You know, lastly, really is just definitely a good partnership between our security and privacy teams, and has helped us approach privacy, say, in a more, I guess, inclusive way versus a siloed approach. Okay. You know, again, hopeful that this is just either a good validation of if you're doing these programs, you know, within your organization, that this has been helpful or at least something to benchmark against. Uh, but that's generally the desire, uh, presenting this aspect to say, hey, this is one approach and uh, definitely hopefully something that has helped uh, provide some insight. Mm. Thank you for that, Matt. Yeah, Thank you. I don't need that. No, yeah, I'm good. glued up. Okay, sounds good. Cool. So, yeah, you get to stand very precariously close to that edge. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my name's Jonathan Jenkin. As was mentioned before, I work with um, AWS Professional Services as a senior security consultant. So, my role is to help customers move their most sensitive workflows onto AWS. And, uh, oh, we're going backwards in time. Oh, is that working now? Oh, cool. Um, so it wouldn't be a security deck if it didn't have the shared responsibility model, right? Um, and it's really important um, from one particular aspect. You'll see that um, this model all over the place, and you'll see that orange line moves up and down depending on which service you're making use of. And, um, but one thing will remain constant is that customer data is always the responsibility of the customer. And um, I would put it to you exactly what Matt has said before, is that actually this becomes a Russian doll, right? 
So um, where that customer data starts, your journey on creating your own shared responsibility model with your customers begins. So inside there is going to be a sort of strata of uh, parts of the infrastructure, parts of management of that data that are, you're responsible for, and parts which your customers will be responsible for. So that's the reason for showing this now, that and the fact that it's not a security deck if it doesn't have the shared responsibility model in as a slide. Um, there are lots of um, security standards out there now and a few regulations, and I just want to uh, punctuate slightly uh, the difference between the two. So a privacy standard um, can be something like PCI DSS. Um, I used to use P PCI DSS as a really good sort of benchmark for saying whether I was managing uh, privacy-related information correctly. Um, so sort of taking the pan and pin out of the equation and just kind of managing privacy-related information uh, in, a, in accordance with PCI DSS. Um, and that has a very structured approach to um, how you can meet that standard, whether you're compliant to that standard or not. An auditor can come in, a third-party auditor can come in and decide whether you are or you are not uh, compliant to that standard. Uh, so that's just what, what I would term a sectorial uh, standard, so that covers a uh, single sector. So you've got things like HIPAA as well for uh, the medical environments. And then you've got um, regulations. Um, so up here we've got the EU uh, data protection and GDPR. Uh, obviously from my accent you might be able to tell I'm from the UK. And um, GDPR is, is a big deal at the moment and it's a very difficult uh, discussion to have with customers. Um, because I'm not a lawyer and there's parts of the discussion that I need to have with my customers about how they're going to meet uh, the risks that are associated with GDPR. There are also uh, data privacy standards and regulations across many other uh, countries. Uh, you, you can see a few there, uh, New Zealand and Germany being um, uh, pretty obvious ones. And there's one in California, which is uh, I think January of next year. Um, so there's lots and lots of uh, privacy regulations and standards and our, our services um, will, uh, will be audited against as many of those as we can and you can go and have a look and see how we um, attest ourselves as meeting those standards uh, using uh, AWS artifacts. So you can dial in through your console and go and check that out. We have terms and conditions which we try to be as transparent about as possible. We have transparency, so we show you exactly how it is that we're managing your data um, through some of those attestations. We provide you with compliance and security tools and services, things like AWS Config, Security Hub, which was announced today as a general release, uh, allow you to do that, and, and also things like Guard Duty, allowing you to have um, automated protection as well. Uh, in terms of detective control. I'd like to highlight, though, um, the Amazon Partner Network and Marketplace. You're, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons AWS came about was that we recognized that scale and our agility were, were two of the things that um, were clearly uh, things that we could offer to our customers. And um, so we were able to allow businesses to operate on our platform on that, uh, on that basis so that they didn't have to worry about the bricks and mortar data centers, that they, so that they didn't have to worry about security guards to hire or, or who has access to data racks and things like that. Customers could actually get on and do the business that they're best at doing and not have to worry about who's got access to pull wires out of the back of, um, of racks. And in the same, in the same way, um, I would say that you're try, if you're trying to meet privacy standards, privacy requirements, your best bet if you're not in that game already is to use some of the partner network to achieve uh, those types of things. So there's uh, a partner that we use uh, in, in uh, professional services quite a lot, uh, which is uh, Data Guys. Uh, data guys have a marketplace solution which uh, does an awesome job of identifying where your uh, privacy related data is. It contextualizes that so if you were to have a field in a database or a field on uh, a volume somewhere that said 30 November Street, it understands that 30 November is not a date, it's actually an address. And so it uses data that's either side of the data being interrogated to be able to classify it as pr private data. 
um, and so it can help track that, it can help mask it, it can help do some encryption on that, it can create granular roles um, that, that allow access or not allow access to particular users. Um, so it, that's a really, really interesting uh, technology that I recommend you go and have a look at. Um, the other one is uh, an emerging technology um, partner called Privitar. Privitar have some really interesting uh, technology to do with pri privacy in big data. So if you're doing AI ML, there are some really difficult um, problems uh, to solve. Uh, one is where, where the, is this private data, is it not private data? Now I've got to mutate and, and, and manage and look after where that data is moving to and from. I've got to make sure that only certain people have access to certain data. I've got to make sure that my machine learning models are learning in, in ways that they're permitted to learn, for example. And Privitar have got some interesting uh, polymorphic uh, encryption uh, technology that allows them to ma manipulate large data sets very quickly. Um, without altering or updating certain, um, without updating certain uh, th those data with uh, and keeping them as encrypted data, um, we have deep security expertise. Um, hopefully, you agree with that. And certainly, within professional services, we have experts within the field. So, I'm an SM SME for uh, both privacy, but also for uh, technologies like uh, Cloud HSM and also for blockchain. So we have lots and lots of deep expertise in some of those fields. And we have those independent audit, audits and attestations which you can go and download through an NDA uh, on AWS Artifact. I want to talk now about the professional services approach and it really kind of synergizes or is very familiar with, with your own story there, Matt. The first is we do a discovery phase. So the first phase, uh, whenever I uh, rock up to um, a professional services engagement uh, to do with privacy is to do that discovery. And it can be quite a painful task. Um, it's painful because um, you have to ask very probing questions about where it is that data is being ingressed into a system, where it is that data then moves within the system, where it is that data then is processed within a system, and where it is that data is then egressed out of the system. Who has access to each of those components? Why is it that you're needing to process that data at any particular point? Do you need to hold on to that data for longer than that period of time? And all those types of the, the rights that you might have over um, that data is really important. So within that discovery phase, we're just asking questions about where are things right now. We're not looking to solutionize. We're not trying to think about, well, we need to encrypt those S3 buckets or we need to put uh, correct protections around IAM policies. We're just looking to see how things are monitored, monitored and managed right now to understand how we then need to reduce that scope. And that's what happens within the assessment phase. Within the assessment phase, customers then look at the discovery that they've made about the way in which they're managing that data and then reflect on that in relation to any sectorial or uh, regulatory uh, compliance that they need to meet. Um, this is the phase that's most difficult for me as a professional services consultant to get involved in because I can't really offer any advice. It really does have to be, in the case of regulatory con controls, I can't offer any advice there because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a solicitor, I don't have a legal bar. Um, but what I can do is help them make some of those assessments. So they can say, we, we f see a risk uh, with regards to um, data exfiltration. And I can then start offering, well, we need to look at how we can manage that. If we managed it at the periphery, if we looked at guard duty as a detective control, does that manage some of the risk that you might perceive? And so then there is a dialogue that needs to go backwards and forwards. Finally, there's the implementation phase, and that's definitely where AWS Professional Services can again help out and help to implement controls that um, uh, manage some of those risks. And so right up until we're doing the assessment, we're really not talking about technology at all. We're not talking about EC2 instances or anything. We've been talking about discovery of what that is, doing an assessment of the risk that's within the discovery, and then doing an implementation which is essentially mitigating some of those risks. 
So that very first phase, the discovery phase, is often complemented or is in a large part to do with the, uh, a, a data protection impact assessment. And this seems to be, uh, there's a bit of a growing trend around doing this. Um, certainly when I was offering this last year as something that we could help customers with, they looked at me very confused and, well, what the hell is a, a, data, a data protection impact assessment? Um, but nowadays it's becoming more, um, more obvious to customers what that is. Um, but still they find a little difficulty in understanding. There's no template out there, for example, on what does a good data protection impact assessment look like. There's no sort of, uh, you know, fill this sheet in, fill this Excel sheet in, or fill this document in and, and everything's good. It is still a bit of an organic process. And um, it's not always uh, trivial to do that. Um, one thing that I tend to use as like my go-to framework is the OECD privacy guidelines and I do recommend that if you have got um, a privacy related requirement at the moment, this is a really good basis to start with. Um, you'll find that most privacy regulations or privacy standards around the world are based on this. So this is the root of all of that pain that some customers are feeling at the moment as they try to uh, meet those privacy standards. But ultimately, it boils down to these few topics. Um, collection limitation is, do I actually need to collect that information in the first place? Uh, data quality is making sure that the data that I do collect is correct. Um, purpose specification is saying why I'm using that data to the person as I collect it, for example. So there's lots of um, these guidelines that you'll see reflected in many privacy regulations and privacy standards, and that's because they really are. The next thing that I help customers do on their, on their road to creating a, a DPIA is to define what personal data looks like in their solution. You can see a few examples here um, of uh, what, might, what a customer might decide to be uh, personal data. Um, some customers may say it's not personal data, other customers might. Uh, certain regulations or rather standards would, would say that um, you know, an IP address is a, uh, is a piece of private data, others may not. So it's important to, um, to work out uh, what, what is private data before you then start tracking that private data as it flows through your system and maybe ingress, egresses that system. A DPIA in my eyes is uh, a diagram potentially that describes your entire architecture in terms of the services that you're making use of, the operations that are taking place at each stage, um, and then why it is that you're needing to operate on some of that data. Um, it also looks at the risks and some of the questions involved in the retention periods and other, other sort of related uh, topics and related questions. When we go through to the assessment stage, we have um, several pieces, uh, several services that um, customers can make use of that, uh, that help them meet those compliance requirements or those uh, privacy requirements. Through, through from identity and access management, which is obviously a preventative control that helps um, manage uh, users that are accessing the console or are accessing AWS services and resources. Identity and access management is a really obvious way that you can restrict or permit access to those resources. Active Directory services and SAML federation are ways that you can allow your existing um, uh, your existing user stores to be able to get access to your AWS console. And it, it is the way in which uh, large customers that I'm working with are making use. I very rarely see uh, AWS um, customers that I work with making use of AW, uh, IAM users anymore. It's very, very rare that I see an IAM user. And most of the time where there are roles, there are, there are roles that are being assumed by a federated uh, user. So they're not really using IAM. Um, as, a, as a user interface, they're not dialing into the console directly, they're using a federation technique. And that, that does manage a risk, right? So the risk that's being managed by, by that is that um, you're, you're managing the start a move a lever process. 
If someone leaves your business or they move between a department um, or they're joining the business, then it's, um, it's very easy for those two stores to become out of sync. So if you're just using a single source of truth for your identity pool, such as Active Directory, then uh, it's, a, it's really easy to manage some of that risk. Whereas if you're creating IAM users for, for every person, then you're going to run a risk that the two become out of sync and someone has access that they maybe shouldn't do or potentially someone doesn't have access to something they should do. For encryption technologies, we have KMS, we have Cloud HSM and AWS Certificate Manager. I'd like to talk briefly about AWS KMS. Um, a lot of people just sort of tick the, the encrypt box on S3. They tick the encrypt box on an EC2 instance that they've started. And I would challenge that slightly by saying, why are you doing that? Now, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying and challenging, why do you think that's a good idea? Because if you're ticking it just because you think you should be ticking it, that's the wrong reason. Just because it's best practice doesn't make it the right thing for you to do. I would challenge and say you should always be turning on KMS encryption because it manages a very specific threat. It manages a couple of threats related to um, if AWS were uh, legally obliged to provide your information to uh, uh, law, f law f uh, services, then we would, we would notify you that we were doing that. We would obviously resist having to hand that information over. But if it's encrypted using KMS, it's going to be junk. It's just going to be encrypted junk. So that's the reason that you turn on KMS is because you're protecting your data from being um, given out to legal services or, the, or, um, or anything like that. You're protecting it against that. And Cloud HSM is, an, is, as I said, I'm a Cloud HSM SME. I've worked with hardware security modules for nearly two decades now. And uh, Cloud HSM is, is really awesome because managing an HSM is really difficult to do. Um, if you're not using an HSM already, don't is my advice. Um, it is very hard to do it well and do it properly, and I highly recommend you get a competent partner in to help you do that if you want to use Cloud HSM and you have a regulatory requirement to do so, or a mandated industry requirement to use an HSM. And we have some other services down here. Amazon Macy is um, uh, constantly undergoing changes and alterations. It's um, it's a really great service for both identifying where your PII data is and also where um, it can also monitor where that data is being exfiltrated. So it can become kind of uh, a very quick hit in terms of getting your security on your privacy bar to, one partic to a particular uh, step um, and, and is a, a very uh, well-developed and very versatile um, tool. Amazon Inspector allows you to manage some of the vulnerabilities that you might see on EC2 instances, for example. So it can manage threats related to those vulnerabilities. So it can, it can both uh, identify where you've got a vulnerability, and then you can have SSM uh, to go in and start patching some of those instances as well. And Guard Duty, which I've spoken about before, is, um, is one of the largest uh, and fastest growing services that we have at AWS at the moment. Um, I, I get involved in a few incidents with customers who are having just a bad day and uh, guard duty oftentimes saves a lot of time for me identifying what might have gone wrong. So where customers have got this on by default, it makes my life as uh, managing incidents and doing incident response significantly easier. And so if you want to manage some of those risks, it should be something that's hitting into your, your mitigation and your um, your implementation phases of, uh, of any privacy-related uh, uh, behaviors that you might have. One other tool that I want to talk about um, before I draw it to a close <laughs> is uh, to talk about um, a blog post that I wrote late last year. And it proposed this process. And I'll be honest with you, so many customers have now spoken about having used this and how much benefit they've got from it that I want, to, I want to share it with you today as well. And basically what we're saying here is we're using a DevOps approach to managing security controls. So what I was saying before about 
don't put security controls in place even though they, it says it's best practice, you should do it because of a reason. And this kind of ekes out what that reason might be. Define your roles. Have a two-pizza team that decides who is involved in your privacy journey. From those roles, then decide what behaviors they need from the system. So that we're talking here about, I want S3 buckets to be encrypted because I want to manage the, the threat of a subpoena. I want to manage the threat of an insider attack. I want to manage whatever it might be. But then we understand why it is we're applying those controls. And so a developer who's then implementing it will make the right decisions about how they implement it, rather than just seeing S3 bucket, tick, done. Ah, I need to make sure that that stays like that, so there are other controls that I might need to write. Okay? So there's an example here, so that I fully understand the best approach and I'm able to understand uh, with my own customers. Another sort of fragment from this is that you can write acceptance criteria for a lot of these controls. So because we've used the DevOps technique here with saying, as a role, I want to sow that outcome, we can write a, given that a certain, um, a certain thing is happening, a certain set of variables are in a particular state, I expect this to happen as a result. So I, uh, you know, given that I am starting, uh, creating a new S3 bucket or uploading uh, an object, I expect that that is encrypted with a KMS key that I control. And so if I've written it like that, I can now write an AWS config rule that then continuously monitors my compliance to that standard. So you now get that, that um, continuous compliance across your environment, making sure that you're adhering to your own privacy standards and managing risks that might be associated with them. So I don't have much more to say, if I'm honest with you. Um, we've got sort of 20 minutes remaining. I did want to talk just, we were talking earlier out there about emerging technologies yeah, yeah. as well, weren't we? Mm -hmm. So. You know, from the emerging technology standpoint, we're talking about, I mean, you mentioned a couple of vendors, or not vendors, but uh, folks that can help in that journey. Yeah. Um, you know, from our end, the emerging technology has largely been what we build into our tools to allow customers to manage their data the way they'd like to manage it. I mean, that was kind of one of the essences that I came yeah. across, but uh, were there any others that you felt that were important to mention? I mean, I would say that, um Certainly if we want to touch on emerging technologies and ethics at the yep. same time, we've got things like AIML, right? And that's a, a obviously a slightly touchy topic. Um, I'd say it's a very difficult topic, but I would draw back to the shared responsibility model. And I would think deeper about what the risks are, sure. right? So the risk in using AIML in a way which might be ethically interesting is your, um, you have a risk, a reputational risk, right? So the reputational risk is that if you use that data in an unethical way, your business will suffer from uh, some reputational damage. And so you can still think about it in terms of the risks and then managing those risks with the user stories as a way of documenting it. So I want to use AIML in an ethical way so that my customers continue to respect and uh, respect the customer brand. It goes along with what you were saying earlier about, hey, why are we doing the things yeah. that we're doing? The risk associated with it is X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. Liberty. Yeah. So um, that's one. Uh, another emerging technology which has some interesting privacy slant to it is blockchain. Mm -hmm. So obviously we have um, AWS managed blockchain now. So we've got um, Hyperledger Fabric. And also we've got, we've got some Ethereum that's coming soon as well. Um, those are interesting topics and certainly when you're looking at it from a privacy perspective, it is worth diving really deep into some of that technology before you launch into it. So I would encourage you to, to run through the DPIA, run through that data privacy impact assessment in terms of using blockchain with any privacy related information uh, before you use it, um, just to make sure that you're, you're absolutely happy with the way in which it's being used. And also we have uh, QLDB, the Quantum Ledger Database, which is an awesome piece of technology. 
essentially a Merkle tree, but um, it's, it's a really handy way of collecting evidence is the way that I've been using it with my customers um, and, and holding some of that state for, for various transactions. Um, but again, you need to think about the data that you're storing on QLDB and managing some of the risks associated with privacy. I don't have anything else to add, and um, I don't want to necessarily, although we're, we're kind of on our own over here. And I want to thank you all, by the way, for, for coming and joining us and talking, uh, we're listening to us at any rate for, for a period of time about privacy, ethics, and emerging technologies. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, listening to myself and Matt. Please do take the survey online. Uh, I know we finished slightly early. Hopefully that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> um, but we do, we do absolutely um, thrive on feedback at AWS. Like data is uh, the most important thing to us. So please do fill in those sheets. Tell us how well or badly we did, that the clicker didn't work. Um, and the slides were a little bit slow, possibly. But we really, really thrive on feedback. If there's uh, services that you want uh, or want to see AWS provide to help you on your privacy journey, then please do find me afterwards or ask your, your SA or your TAM. Uh, really happy to do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.